two, one, sending live. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Voderberg. I'm the chief of Broadband Ohio. Uh, we're going to give this just another uh, minute or two for people to go ahead and be on. If you will give us just a minute, probably about 2.04, we will get started. Um, but we are anticipating getting started as quickly as possible. We just know that there's a few attendees who are who have uh, requested um, the link a little late, so we're gonna give it just a minute to get those folks on and we will be with you in just a second. So hang tight at 2.04 in about 60 seconds or so, we will go live. Okay, everyone, it is now 2.04. Um, we have quite a few attendees that are already here and I want us to get started because I know we have a lot of information to cover in just a short amount of time. Um, and I know we wanna get to many of your questions and answers as well. So we wanna make sure that we have an opportunity to do that. So we're gonna jump right in as of right now. So welcome everyone and good afternoon. My name is Peter Voderberg and I am the Chief of Broadband Ohio. Welcome to the Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Grant Program Webinar. Today's webinar focuses on the expansion grant program, and we will do a deep dive into the program and application. I am joined this afternoon by Patrick Smith, Assistant Chief, as well as Amy Elbor, who is the Deputy Chief of Grants and Special Projects. Now, I'm first going to give a quick overview of the agenda for today's webinar and then proceed with some background information on Broadband Ohio. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded today and will be posted on the Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Grant Program website. We will have a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar today. Please post your questions in the chat feature of Microsoft Teams. If your question is not answered today, we will post the question and the response on <clears throat> in the future in a frequently asked questions document that will be posted again on the grant program website. So let's go over the agenda. So first, we'll talk a little bit about background information on Broadband Ohio. Next, we'll talk about background information on the Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Grant Program. We'll review the websites. We'll review the actual application process, application and important application documents. We'll review the timeline and we'll do the question and answer session. So what is Broadband Ohio? Well, Broadband Ohio was created by the DeWine Houston Administration in March of 2020. The Broadband Ohio office is part of the Ohio Department of Development. It was dedicated to improving access to high-speed internet to the people and areas of Ohio who are unserved and underserved. The Broadband Ohio grant program background information that I wanna share with you today is that the grant program itself began from House Bill 2 of the 134th General Assembly. That created the Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Program that we're talking about. It was created to help internet service providers offset the cost of expanding into areas that lack service today. The program is designed to assist with the infrastructure costs of the project and help build the networks that will otherwise serve Ohioans who currently cannot participate in the modern economy because of a lack of high-speed internet. So let's talk about what the Broadband Ohio grant program is from a broadband funding gap perspective. 
So the broadband funding gap is the difference between the actual cost of building the infrastructure for the network and the amount of money the application can afford or the applicants can afford to spend to build the infrastructure for the network and still make a profit. So we want to make sure that you have the capability of building those networks. And to do that, we want to make sure that if your rate of return needs to be a certain level, that you can make that in certain areas where you wouldn't have otherwise been able to have made that rate of return before. So let's talk a little bit about the authority. The program authority was created by House Bill 2, which oversees the grant. The Ohio Department of Development staffs the authority and performs tasks such as receiving and reviewing applications. The authority scores and approves applications for the grant and consists of five members. The first is the Director of Development or her designee. The second is the Director of Innovate Ohio, currently Lieutenant Governor or his designee. One member appointed by the Governor of Ohio. One member appointed by the Speaker of the Ohio House and one member appointed by the Ohio Senate President. So that's a little bit of the background information on the on Broadband Ohio and the grant, and I will now turn the presentation over to Amy Elbor, who is the Deputy Chief of Grants and Special Projects for Broadband Ohio. Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Elbor, and I'm the Deputy Chief of Grants and Special Projects for Broadband Ohio. I will be your main point of contact throughout the grant application process and beyond. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and now I would like to discuss the application requirements in detail. Please also remember to submit your questions in the chat box. So first, I want to go over who the eligible, eligible applicants are. The eligible applicants are broadband providers. A broadband provider means a video service provider, a provider that can provide Tier 1 or Tier 2 broadband service and is one of the following, a telecommunications service provider, a satellite broadcasting service provider, and a wireless service provider. Tier 1 broadband service means a retail wireline or wireless broadband service capable of delivering internet access at speeds of at least 10 to less than 25 megabits per second downstream and at least 1 but less than 3 megabits per second upstream. Tier 2 broadband service means a retail wireline or wireless broadband service capable of delivering internet access at speeds of at least 25 megabits per second downstream and at least three megabits per second upstream. Eligible projects are projects that will provide service access of at least 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload to residences in areas that do not have a provider that can supply that speed. There is currently no dollar amount limit for what providers can ask for while submitting their applications. Information on Broadband Ohio, the program authority, the application process, and our guidebook, timelines, and important dates and links can be found at the link listed here. The guidebook is your playbook to refer to while applying for the grant program. This document will help provide, will help broadband providers understand the application process and the requirements of the Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Grant Program. Contents of the guidebook include grant timeline, important dates, grant information, contact information, application process, and a review and explanation of each section of the application. If you have any questions while filling out your application, please make sure to reference your guidebook for the answers as well as the frequently asked questions document that was listed on our website. There are four ways that you can apply for the Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Grant Program online, paper application, electronic mail, also known as email, or in-person submission. The links to the online application and PDF can be found at the grant program website. So I am right now going to share one second. So the application can be found via the Ohio Department of Development website at development.ohio.gov. This is the web page that has all of the information. On the left hand side, you can see that you can find the online application as well as the paper application, the guidebook and the scoring criteria, as well as important dates and my contact information. The content of the paper application is the same as it is online, just in paper form. 
you can supplement responses with additional pages as necessary. In-person submissions will need to be dropped off at the Rice Building, which is 77 South High Street on the 29th floor. Please be mindful that the Rice Building operates under normal business hours and requires multiple security checks to get into the building. Please call ahead before traveling to the Rice Building to make sure you'll be able to access the building. Paper applications can also be submitted via email to my email address, which is listed here at amy.elbor at development.ohio.gov. We are now going to walk through an example of what a submitted application looks like. So when you go to submit your application, you will click online application and it'll take you to this website. Applicants will need to register as a member of the website. If you do not already have a username and password for the website, please make sure to register with a working email address. You will click not a member under the log on button. You will then fill out your name, last name, email, and put in your password. Further instructions on signing in will be then sent to the registered email address. So I'm going to log in with my email address. That is right here. Okay, so the application we're gonna look through today is a dummy application and has already been submitted. You will not be able to submit your applications until the application period opens on September 6th. You will need your federal tax ID number to register so that the system can find any of the applications listed under your name or to begin the process. So here again is the dummy application and I'm gonna now go through the steps. All right. Please make sure to read in full the proprietary and trade secret information at the top of the screen. The notice regarding trade secret and proprietary information states that the applicant Proband provider must notify development of any information contained in the application or within related documents submitted with the application and that the provider considers proprietary information or trade secret. Neither Broadband Ohio nor development will make this determination outside of the applicant properly identifying which parts of the application are proprietary or trade secret. Next, the applicant name is the name of the broadband provider that is applying for the grant and not necessarily the name of the person completing the form. The authorized representative name should be the name of the authorized representative of the broadband provider. Again, applicants must include the federal employer identification number where requested. The applicant address field is the main mailing address for the applicant and the project contact name should be the name of the individual that should be contacted by development or the authority on any necessary follow-up regarding the application. The email address and phone number can be any email address where the applicant can be notified of the status of the application. It is important that the applicant use an email address that is checked often as much of our official correspondence for this grant will be done through email. Once you're done filling out all this information, please hit next and then tab two will be your project attachment. Attach each of the following attachments to your application in PDF format. Please label each attachment with their proper attachment identifier. The attachments that have a checkbox next to them are required. And we'll start at the beginning here at 2A. 2A is the list of residential addresses in the unserved or tier one areas where tier two broadband service will be available following completion of the project. This must be actual addresses that will be served by the project and not a shape or map file. Please also include evidence that these addresses do not currently have available service that meets 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload speed. This evidence can be FCC 477 data, RDOF maps, 
speed test data or other sources that are available. Development will evaluate the evidence and inform the applicant of whether additional information is necessary. Attachment 2B is a notarized letter of intent that the broadband provider will provide access to Tier 2 broadband service to all the residential addresses listed in the project. A template for this letter can be found in the guidebook. Attachment 2C is a notarized letter of intent by the broadband provider that none of the funds provided by the program grant will be used to extend or deploy facilities to any residences other than those in the unserved or Tier 1 areas that are part of the project. A template for this letter can also be found in the guidebook. Next, a notarized letter by the broadband provider that neither the applicant nor any other applicant entity has commenced construction of any portion of this project and that the project will not commence prior to the receipt of a program grant award and that the receipt of the funds is essential to the applicant's ability to undertake this project. Again, a template for this letter can be found in the guidebook. The next following attachments are optional. They will impact your scoring of the project, but are not a necessary component to the application. Applicants are encouraged to provide this information when it's applicable to the project. Attachment 2A, please provide evidence that the project is located in a distressed area, whether a county or a municipality. A map of the distressed cities and counties can be found on the website for the Department of Development. Please use the prior priority investment map for the most recent year to determine which the project is located in a distressed county or municipality. The next attachment will provide evidence that all or a portion of the addresses submitted as part of the application are located in an opportunity zone or multiple opportunity zones. A list of opportunity zones in Ohio can be found on the Ohio Oppor Opportunity Zones website. Please download the list to determine whether any of the addresses in your project area are located in an opportunity zone. And then next, please provide an attachment listing whether your project will utilize state rights of way or otherwise require attachment to or use of public facilities or conduit to provide tier two broadband service to an eligible project and where these facilities are located. So once you're done with all the attachments, you will then click next and we will go to the next tab, which is the funding tab. Tab three is where you will put in the dollar amounts for the broadband funding gap and the amount of grant funds requested. The amount of broadband funding gap is the amount between the cost necessary for the provider to make it expected return and the amount of money that the project will actually cost. The amount of funds requested field should be the dollar amount that the applicant is requesting from the grant and the amount cannot be larger than the broadband funding gap. The total project cost is the full amount of the project cost, including the broadband funding gap. The next section on this page is the amount and sources of financial and in-kind contributions. Please specify the financial and in-kind contributions the applicant intends to put towards the broadband funding gap. Include the amount of the contribution and the source. For in-kind contributions, estimate the monetary value. Next, Complete the information regarding financial and in-kind contributions for part of the project that are not applied to in the grant funding gap. Please include a brief description of the use of the contribution, and this can be added as an attachment. Please note that between 4A and 4B, the applicant is expected to report the entirety of any and all financial and in-kind contributions that will otherwise be applied to the project cost. Failure to disclose any financial or in-kind contribution that will otherwise apply to the applicant may result in a rejection of the application for incompleteness. And we will now go to the next tab. This section of the application is where the applicant will provide information regarding managerial, technical, and broadband project experience. For managerial experience, describe the management experience of the applicant in general and of the manage managers that will be on the project. For the description of expertise, technical expertise, describe how the applicant has the technical expertise to complete the project, including any possible certifications that are applicable and other, other credentials. For the description of service project experience, please provide information detailing how the applicant has completed similar projects as the one being applied for. The applicant 
may choose to attach additional documentation down at the bottom of the screen detailing managerial, technical, and broadband project experience. On to the next screen here, the next tab. The next section is where the applicant will talk about the technology and scalability of the projects, as well as history and process of the provider's customer service policies and procedures. For this next part, please check the applicable boxes with what technology the applicant intends to use on the project. More than one box may be checked. Next, please complete the information regarding the minimum and maximum download and upload speed. Note, please note that the minimum speeds may not be lower than 25 megabits for download and 3 megabits for upload. Applications with speeds lower than 25.3 will be rejected for being incomplete. For the scalability section, please complete the information describing how your project is scalable. Describe how the speeds can be increased and how it may lead to providing service to additional areas around the area of the application. Please provide information regarding customer service procedures by providing a description of customer service capabilities. Include any relevant information, including but not limited to how long it takes to resolve complaints, wait times for customer service, service surveys for customer satisfaction, or other relevant information detailing customer service capabilities. Please identify any call centers or customer service centers that are located in Ohio. If there are no offices in the state, please indicate not applicable. This information can also be included in an attachment. Provide a copy of the applicant's general customer service policies, including any policy to credit customers for service outages or the provider's failure to keep scheduled appointments for the service. This should be a documentation that is otherwise provided to a new customer that receives a service from the applicant, and this can be uploaded as well as an attachment. Please make sure to indicate the appropriate number of years and months the applicant has provided broadband service in the state. If the provider is new, a new, pro, a new broadband provider or has not yet offered services inside of the area, please say not applicable. And the next section is the financial attachments tab. Please remember that if there is a check box in the check boxes, if there is a check in the check boxes, this indicates that the documentation is necessary to, necessary to submit the application. The first attachment is for proof of financial stability. This evidence may include publicly available financial statements, copies of federal and state tax returns, and other documents that may provide proof of financial stability. Please make a note whether the financial statements are prepared internally or by third party. It may also include other documents, for example, a letter of credit or a bond. This can be included as attachment, multiple attachments. For the next attachment, please include a projected construction timetable, including the anticipated date of the provision of two-tier broadband services access within the project area. Provide as much detail as you are able to, including when estimated permits or easements may be obtained for the project area. The government authorizations attachment is next and includes the following. A description of anticipated or preliminary government authorizations, permits, and other approvals required in connection with the project, and an estimated timetable for the acquisition of such approvals. Descriptions of any authorizations permit to use public infrastructure that have already been obtained or executed. If you do not know the anticipated authorizations needed for this project or do not need any permits for the construction, please attach a document saying not applicable. For the refund upon non-compliance section, please attach a notarized statement affirming that the application applicant broadband provider accepts the condition that the non-compliance with the Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Grant Program requirements may require the provider to refund all or part of any program grant that provider receives. Next, you are able to attach a description of any arrangements, including any subleases of infrastructure or joint ownership arrangements that the applicant broadband provider has entered into or plans to enter into with either another broadband provider, an electric cooperative, and or an electric distribution utility to enable the offering of tier two broadband service under this project. 
If there are no agreements in the project, please attach a document saying not applicable. You will notice that the remaining five attachments are not required, but these attachments may result in the application receiving additional points according to the scoring criteria, but again, are not required. For the first attachment, please complete the section detailing an application, an explanation of the applicant's ability to leverage nearby or adjacent infrastructure to facilitate the proposed deployment and provision of tier two infrastructure. Stated a little differently, please describe how you may be using already existing poles, conduit, rights of way, or other existing assets that lead up to the area you are intending to build your network. Next, you can add detail whether existing tier one or tier two broadband service infrastructure exists in the project and the extent to which the project utilizes or upgrades the existing tier one or tier two infrastructure rather than duplicates it. And then at the bottom here, you, you'll see that you have a chance to upload an executive summary or project narrative. Please limit this attachment to no more than five pages. And finally, we um, we welcome you to attach copies of any local letters of support, including letters that detail providing broadband to sur the surrounding areas through other means. And then at the end where it says other documents, please attach any additional information you as the applicant deems necessary for the grant authority to understand the application or the applicant's ability to complete the proposed project. The last tab of the application The last tab of the application is the Submit Application tab. Please read the top section in bold carefully. You will then type in the authorized person's name and title and press Submit. You will see at the top of the screen that you should get a notification that says the application is submitted and under review. This section in the paper copy of the application is an additional page and will need to be filled out and completed with the same information and signed. And you will also receive an email once you submit the application as well. Now I'm going to get back to our PowerPoint here. Give me one second. Okay. And then I just want to real quickly, if you are submitting applications via paper, um, or certified mail, this is the address that you will send to. So it's Ohio Development Services Agency, Office of Broadband Ohio, attention Amy Elbor, and our address is 77 South High Street, the 29th floor. And again, remember there are security procedures if you are coming to, um, to deliver your application. And um, now let me get to the timeline. Give me one second. Okay, so currently our application and scoring criteria are posted on our website that was posted starting August 6th. The application submission period opens September 6th, which means all of the information that you have saved, if you have already started your application, can now be submitted. Our deadline for submission is November 8th by 5 p.m. Your deadline to refile an incomplete Application is 14 days after the application deadline. Application challenge deadline is January 13th, 2022. And then the deadline to refile suspended applications are 14 days after that application was suspended. The application review period lasts up to 30 days and the award announcement will take up to 30 days. So for the review process on the application, the Department of Development will evaluate the information and documents submitted by the broadband provider in an application. If an application is incomplete, development will provide notice to the broadband provider listing what information is incomplete and provide the guidelines for a procedure to refile a completed application. If an application is determined to be incomplete after the application period has closed, a provider may ask for an extension to refile the application. Incomplete applications that are not refiled will be rejected and not scored by the grant authority. Okay. 
Okay. And now we will turn it over to Peter to do um, to talk a little bit about the scoring process. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the application scoring process. So the scoring criteria were developed by a team that consisted of the Department of Development, the Department of Administrative Services, Innovate Ohio, and the Governor and Lieutenant Governor's offices. The scoring criteria is a product of the statute, which describes the weighted components that the authority is intended to consider when reviewing an application for the Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Grants. The first three are weighted criteria are formulas. The first criterion is the percentage of unserved households compared to the amount of underserved households in the application. This is determined as a formula where the amount of unserved households are divided by the total households in the project and then multiplied by the possible available points. The second criterion is how much of the project area is in a distressed area. Distressed areas are defined in the Ohio Revised Code and available on the Department of Development's website. Again, a formula is used to determine the value by dividing the number of houses in a distressed area by the entire number of houses in the project and multiplying the result by the possible point value. The third criterion is the amount of financial and in-kind support the project has received to move forward. We again reduce this to a formula where we divide the amount of financial support by the entire funding amount to determine the value that is then multiplied by the full point value. The other criteria will be evaluated by the authority to make determinations on which applications receive funding. So the fourth criterion is whether the project uses state rights of way or public facilities for the project. The fifth criteria is based upon the proposed speeds and scalability of the project. The sixth and final criterion is split evenly among multiple subparts. The first subpart is demonstrated support for community and economic development efforts as a result of the project. The second subpart is the broadband provider's experience, technical and financial capability in deploying the project. The third subpart is the length of time the broadband provider has been providing tier two service to the state, the fourth subpart is the extent that funding is necessary to deploy the project. The fifth subpart is the ability of the provider to leverage nearby infrastructure. And the sixth subpart is how the provider will utilize existing infrastructure in the project area by upgrading it. The final subpart is whether the project is located in an opportunity zone. These subpart scores will be added together to make the final score. The authority will determine the final scores of the submitted applications based upon the information in the applications. And now I will turn it back over to Amy to complete the presentation. Thank you, Peter. I just want to speak a little bit um, real quickly before we get to the award process about the challenge process. Broadband grant applications may be challenged in writing by a broadband provider on the specific grounds after an application is published on the development's website, but not later than 65 days after the submission period closes. A broadband provider whose application is suspended based on the successful challenge is permitted to revise and resubmit the provider's application to the authority within 14 days of being notified and their application was suspended. Failure to revise and resubmit the application with the successfully challenged addresses removed may result in the rejection of the entire application. So now a little bit on the award process. Prior to the start of a project, the authority may require a broadband provider that is awarded a program grant to provide acceptable financial assurances, which may include a performance bond, letter of credit, or other assurances accessible to the authority. After receiving an award, the broadband provider must construct and install last mile broadband infrastructure to the eligible project in accordance with the awarded application. Grant program awards will be dispersed incrementally with up to 30% dispersed before the construction of the project begins, up to 60% dispersed throughout the periodic payments over the course of construction, and then the remaining grant amount dispersed within 60 days after the project is complete. The project start date will be for the project will be mutually agreed to between the authority and the broadband provider. There will be reporting requirements that grantees will have to follow throughout, throughout the, and, during, and during the project and after the projects are complete. Grant awardees will be required to submit an annual progress report each year on a date designated by the authority during the construction phase. Grant awardees will be required then to submit an operational report within 60 days and for four years thereafter once the project is completed. 
If development determines that a project is non-compliant, development will give the broadband provider an opportunity to explain and cure the non-compliance or else may provide a refund or grant award fund. And then again, I just wanted to go over our, our important dates right now with you. Again, your application and scoring criteria are posted. Application submission begins Monday, September 6th, and then our deadline for submission is Monday, November 8th by 5 p.m. And that's a typo. Oh, nope, not a typo. By 5 p.m. Um, by 5 p.m., this means in the application portal and submitted as well and in person and delivered via email by 5 p.m. If you are mailing your applications, the mailed applications must be received in our office on or before November 8th. And before we get to the frequently asked questions, I just I just want to thank everyone for joining us today um, and taking the time to learn about Broadband Ohio and our Ohio Residential Broadband Expansion Grant Program. We definitely look forward to receiving your applications. And now I am going to unshare my screen really quickly so I can pull up our, we have an already existing frequently asked questions document. So bear with me one moment here. There we go. And this again will be an ongoing document that will be posted on our website and updated as we receive applications. Um, and so now we're going to read your questions that you have been submitting in the chat. If we cannot get an answer for you during this session, we will add all of the questions and responses to this document that can be found on our website. And now we're gonna have Patrick start reading the questions. Patrick, I'm sorry. Patrick, I think you're muted. Still can't. All right, folks, give us one second here. Are you able to hear me now? I am able to hear you now. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I apologize for the technical difficulties there. All no right. Uh, first questions are pretty easy ones, I think. Uh, just will this recording, uh, the recording of this event, be posted after the webinar? Yes, we will post it on our website. Great. All right. Um, will this deck be posted on the, the website, the slide deck? Yes, we will post the, the, the PowerPoint as well. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Amy, I think there's one for you. Will there be a confirmation of submission if it is an online or via email uh, application submitted? Yes, no matter your mode of um, submitting the application, we will get you a notice that says that it was submitted. Great, thank you. All right, shift in gear slightly, but but I think in the same realm. How many areas can we apply for per application? So we do not have a limit on that. Um, you can, app providers can submit separate applications for separate areas. Okay. What can be classed as an in-kind contribution? So we will, um, let me write that down, and we will list examples. I'm not, I'm gonna wait and list that as examples on the document. Okay, in the same realm, is pre-planning and engineering and engineering classed as a start of construction? I can take this one really quickly, Amy. So this is Peter, so the, the answer to that is, you, because we have an anticipation that you'll have to have done some preliminary work to be able to go ahead and get um, information to put your applications together, the answer is no, many of the pre-planning activities that you will be doing are not counted uh, against you uh, having started construction. We will get you some better examples that we can put in the FAQ, but things like uh, putting together MOUs, doing engineering analyses and things like that um, to be able to, to put the project together, we understand 
are things that you're going to want to do in certain cases before you have that application started. And so from that perspective, the pre-planning stages are not. There will be some things that you do. And I, like I said, we will have a better list put together. Um, we're working with our legal department on that as well. Um, and so, but we'll we'll put some of the answer. We'll put a, put a more clear and succinct answer in the FAQ document over the next few days. Thanks, sir. All right. What is the term length considered in calculating the funding gap? I think I know what they mean, Amy, if I can jump in on this one too. Sure. So basically, the the there isn't necess, uh, the statute doesn't say how long the term length is for the calculation of the funding gap. Really, it comes down to what the business practice is of the internet service provider. So if the internet service provider normally has an ROI of 60 months, you know, five years, then that's the that's the term length that we're talking about. There isn't a term length that's necessary. It, we won't. The, the term length that we're talking about, you won't be, the, there's nothing that specifies how long it has to be or doesn't have to be. Um, similarly to the broadband funding gap, there's nothing that tells us how that you are supposed to calculate it. So we, you know, you as internet service providers know what that funding gap looks like and um, are in a better position to tell us what it is. So that's, uh, we'll put more, we'll, we will answer this more fully in the FAQ, but that's the answer as of right now. Thank you. How do you qualify the maps and map sources? Sure, so we um, are, and I think we have a, a, a kind of an ongoing list here of what eligible service, um, what evidence we can use. Um, so we're, we're being pretty flexible with the evidence that um, we're accepting. So like I said, the FCC maps and data, RDOS data, um, the NTIA um, indicators of broadband need maps, the NVAM map, speed test data, um, and other relevant data that you as a provider would like to put forward. Oh, thanks, Amy. And, and kind of in a similar vein, um, with regards to the eligible areas, are areas determined based on 477 maps, another map, or can the IS? P deter, uh, self determine eligible areas based on their knowledge of the area. I think pretty much uh, what you just answered. Sure. So we, we do need some sort of sort of evidence that it is um, an area that's unserved or underserved. Um, so we we cannot take a. So if there is a self determining aspect of it, we just need some evidence behind that as far as, um, for example, the speed test data. Right. Continue on. on. Uh, great questions. Um, all right. Why are we lowering the bar as far as speeds go and not requiring 100 megabits metrical speeds? And why is latency lower not addressed? Sure, I can take that one really quickly. So from that perspective, the 25.3 is the floor. It was what the FCC had stated as the um, definition of broadband internet, of high-speed internet. Um, we do not want to fund just the floor, but we had to put a floor somewhere. So the 25.3 is the floor and not the ceiling. That's why scalability is a large portion of the scoring criteria. We want to see you go as fast as you possibly can um, to be able to get services out to everyone as fast as you can. Um, we'll get you more information on the latency question here um, in the FAQ document. Great, and the questions are continuing to flood in. Appreciate uh, the interest and the opportunity to, to answer some of these. Um, are areas that are unserved or tier one that have been awarded federal funds, for example, RDOF, eligible for project funding? I can take that one, Amy, really quickly. So they are eligible for project funding. However, they also possibly would be challenged. Um, and the reason that they may be challenged is because the legislation says, and as Amy went over um, in the challenge process, as long as you are in a, in a um, the challenge process isn't just for an internet service provider who is currently providing services in an area, it's for an internet service provider in a directly adjacent area that has the capability of providing internet services into the area over the course of the next two years. And as a result of that, um, the RDOF winner, if they are going to come in with the next two years, would be able to say, I'm going to be there in the next two years. 
So you, because we still don't know, um, we know that some of the RDOF territories um, might not uh, actually get um, funding. They may be uh, relinquished by some of the internet service providers and things like that. We didn't want to cut them out at the beginning, so you can apply for them. Uh, just know that you may receive a challenge uh, when you apply for them. Great, appreciate it. Yeah, the questions are, are coming in quick. Um, all right, shifting directions a little bit. Um, a county interested in expanding broadband can apply. They need to find a provider to apply question. Correct, a county cannot apply. A provider is the only eligible applicant for the application. Great. Just trying to go through some of these and group them where I can. All right, is there a standard time frame? kind of going back to a, a question we had earlier, Peter, a standard time frame to be used when determining the funding gap? For example, an anticipated return in 12 months, 24 months, three years. We've heard from a lot of internet service providers um, that five years is kind of what they expend, if they, the, the return is that um, they're looking for to be able to make. Um, so I wouldn't say that we have a typical one, but five years is what we have been told multiple times. Um, if it is sure, that's great. If it's a little longer, that's great too. Um, so we don't want to hold you to a specific time frame because we, the broadband funding gap is there to make sure that you have the capability of building something in an area that wouldn't have it um, and, and receiving assistance to be able to do that. So we don't want to hold you to a specific time frame. We want to make sure that you have the time frames necessary to be able to complete. And I do want to address something here really, really quickly. The guidebook originally said that you had to complete your projects within two years. That is, that was an incorrect statement. You do not need to complete your projects within two years. It was an incorrect juxtaposition of the two year challenge process, um, of the two year challenge process and, um, the, uh, the the time that you need to complete your projects. So as Amy said, you'll you'll give us what your project timeline is. That'll be evaluated as part of the scoring criteria and agree to mutually for a start date between the 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 Department of Development uh, as well as the Internet Service Provider who wins a grant. So I just wanted to clear that up really quickly since I had an opportunity here, mm -hmm. and that'll be in the FAQ as well. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, great clarification. Um, all right, uh, another another question around timelines and time frames. Um, for construction timeable, uh, do you want a general length for aspects of the project or do you want approximate dates? Uh, if specific, wouldn't that be, be dependent upon the award timetable? Sure, it'll definitely be um, dependent on the award timetable. As, as detailed as possible, that's what I always like to um, say. As much detail as you can as possible, but um, given that, you know, this is, you wouldn't be finding out in the first of the year um, if the award is made. Um, we will take some generalization. Great. All right. Um, a question coming in. My understanding is that the areas currently receiving satellite service of 25.3 are eligible for the program. Is that correct? I noticed satellite providers can apply for the program. Yes, that is correct. Areas that are served by satellite are eligible. Oh, all right. Uh, question uh, regarding counties. Um, okay. I saw something in the program rules stating that county commissioners can request development uh, to request applications on their behalf for, for eligible projects in their county. Can you please provide more information on that? So we will um, submit that. Um, we'll put that in for on the FAQ document because um, while I know what they are talking about, I want to give be able to give specific instructions and language on that. So that will be included in the FAQ document. Great, thank you. Right. Application, the application asks for sufficient evidence that speeds in service areas less than 25.3. What does that mean by service area? So the area that um, the service area is the area that you will be going in and providing service to.
All right, another question similar, uh, repeating the satellite one. Repeat of the RDOF question. Uh, I'll, I'll say it again, but but Peter, I think it's the same answer. Uh, how would RDOF maps be used to determine eligible service areas? Would only those RDOF areas that were not bid on by providers be considered eligible areas? Sorry, can you repeat that again, Patrick? Oh, I apologize, yes. Uh, yeah. So how would RDOF maps be used to determine eligible service areas? Would only those RDOF areas that were not bid on by providers be considered eligible areas? I'll take this one really quickly, Amy. So um, the two, two, I have a two part answer. The first part of the answer is, if an area was eligible for RDOF and was not bid on, it would definitely be um, eligible for this grant process. So that is one way that RDOF maps could be used. The second way is, because we're still not 100% sure where all, whether all the RDOF territories that were bid on and taken are going to receive services, you still have the capability of applying for those areas. Um, just understand that, they, they, that if those areas do get completely taken and um, will be served within the next two years, that the person who won the RDOF auction in those areas will be able to challenge you successfully. So we'll clarify this a little bit more in the FAQ, but this is similar to the way that NTIA did their most recent um, grant program as well, where they didn't completely exclude the RDOF territories, but just had the understanding that if, depending on how RDOF goes, that those territories may be excluded on the tail. So we wanted to have as many territories open as possible, and that's how the RDOF maps are, are otherwise capable of being the evidence that you have that a place is otherwise unserved or underserved. Thank you, sir. All right, kind of circling back to the county question uh, for government entities. Is there a map available to indicate broadband providers in our areas? There really isn't a map that adequately shows where all of the broadband providers are. There are some services that exist that uh, give you the capability of kind of finding those um, providers in your area, um, or at least the providers that are close to you. And we can put some of those in the FAQ so that you can click on them and look. Thank you, sir. And I think Amy, this is addressed in your FAQ document there, but but Peter uh, and Amy just um, kind of question around who can apply. Uh, do existing local government, cooperative and nonprofit broadband network providers qualify for these grant funds? So I would, I'm going to, so the nonprofit providers, I believe, yes, correct, Peter? Yes, that's correct. Okay, yes, nonprofit providers are. They do have to be an internet service provider. Thank you. And then coming down to the last couple of questions I have here, I think they're similar. I'm just going to try to read them quick and see if they're. All right, if an area has broadband service available via satellite at speeds better than 25.3, is this area eligible for funding? Yeah. Okay. And we'll just add in the FAQ. Yeah. All right, uh, very similar question. If an area has broadband service available via mobile wireless at speeds better than 25.3, is this area, area eligible for funding? So if an area is served by a wireless and is at 25.3 or above, the areas are not eligible. And it depends on how that wireless is. Like it, if it's in-home internet, then the answer would be it is not eligible. But if it's something where it's like someone has wireless on their phone, but they don't have in-home wireless, then the answer would be no. It would be, or I don't want to be confusing. It is ineligible if it's a wireless service provider providing in-home internet. It is eligible if it is a cell phone carrier that's otherwise providing like a hotspot or something through your phone. Thank you, yes, I believe that addresses the question. And hopefully I said it right, but we'll make sure that's in the FAQ as well. Yep. All right, Peter and Amy, that is all the questions I have for right now in the live Q&A chat session. Really appreciate everybody's great questions. And, and as we've said, we will absolutely kind of re rework these and get them get them into that FAQ document. So it's all kind of kind of listed out uh, and answered in writing as well. 
turn it back to you, Mr. Rutterberg. Sure, thank you so much, Patrick. First, I want to say thank you to my team, to Patrick and Amy. They have both done such a phenomenal job. Amy really created this uh, um, webinar from scratch. She did a great job with the script and putting together all the information, um, and she's done a fantastic job with this grant so far, so I really want to thank Amy for all of her time and attention to this. Patrick uh, has been invaluable in helping stand up the grant. Um, and getting uh, all of the ad or the 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 uh, the um, webinar components together. Cody Lentfest, who is with us as well, has our producer and has done a fantastic job. I can't stress enough how great he has been to be able to do this Teams meeting. And again, um, without Amy, there wouldn't be a grant. Without Patrick, there wouldn't be Broadband Ohio. Uh, and uh, I really want to say thank you to everyone who's helped um, make this a possibility. And I also want to thank all of you for participating on this webinar. We really look forward to applications. We really want to make this program successful. Uh, we want to make sure that the money that was appropriated by the General Assembly really does go out the door and serve Ohioans all across the state of Ohio. So uh, we look forward to your applications. Please keep those questions coming in. Please make sure that you reach out to us if you, have, if you need any more information. Um, but other than that, as of now, the webinar is concluded. Thank you everyone so much for participating.